Today we'll cover rational functions and simplifying rational expressions. And it will be just a one part video. Hopefully we can finish the whole lesson. And I think we will. So what we're going to be doing is simplifying rational expressions, of course. But also we're going to be finding the domain of some rational functions, like the, like the ones we have here, f of x, g of x, and f of x again. So before we get into that, let's look at what we have here for the definition of a rational expression. And like I have told you before, it will be the ratio of two polynomials. So uppercase P, uppercase Q are represented polynomials. And then we have here a little warning that says Q cannot be zero. And we know that if we divide by zero, we have problems there, right? What would it be? Undefined. So because we're going to say if Q is equal to zero, then P over Q will be P over zero. which is undefined. And so when we talk about rational functions that will have an x on the denominator, we have to be very careful with those x values that will make the denominator turn into a zero. zero. Like if you were to replace certain number in the denominator, it will make it be zero. So that's how we're going to find the domain. And what are we going to do with those numbers that will make the denominator be zero? We're going to count them as exclusions because we don't want our function to be undefined. So we're going to exclude them from the domain. So let's take a look at the first problem. And we're going to simplify it first. So we'll have f of x is equal to 8x cubed divided by 2 plus 7x squared divided by 2 and then plus 20 divided by 2. So the 2 is dividing every single term in the numerator. Um, here we're going to simplify, and we will get 8 divided by 2 is 4, so 4x four cubed. 7 divided by 2 is 3.5, or we can just leave it as a fraction. There's nothing wrong with that. x squared, and then 20 divided by 2 is 10. So from here, what I'm going to say is that this function is actually a polynomial. polynomial function. Uh, and so for polynomial function, the domain is all real numbers. Now how can we represent all real numbers we're still talking about the domain, but now I want to say that in interval notation. Open parentheses. Open parentheses, very good. Zero, comma, infinity. Well, the negative infinity is infinity. good, but negative. let's include the negative. So instead of zero, okay. negative infinity. Very nice. Um, now let's look at um, set notation. And in set notation, we're going to use the curly bracket or braces. And that will say any x such that x belongs to the set of real numbers. So this, the line, it looks like an L, but longer. It actually represents, it means such that. The one that looks like an E, it means belongs to. Some people read it as is an element of. And then the R with the double leg, it means the set of real numbers. And the symbols, guys, they're universal math symbols. So anyone studying math in China, in India, in Japan, in Russia, they use 
the same symbols that you guys are seeing here. So there are professors um, who used to tell me, oh yeah, I'm reading this book, uh, uh, it's in like a different language. And like, we'll be like, really, you can follow it? And like, oh yeah, it's super easy. And if it's just the symbols, which a lot of upper level math classes are, um, they were able to understand it and even translate to like other languages. So let's go back to the second problem. And now right here, if we look at the denominator, there's one number that if x was equal to that number, the one. denominator will be zero. What did I hear? One. one. So is Matthew right? Yes, because if we make this x be a one, we will have one minus one, which is zero. And then we have issues, right? That will make the function undefined. So sometimes it's not so obvious that you can just look at it and say, oh, it's the one. So when that happens, you need to rely on inequality. And so we could say x minus 1 cannot equal 0 because we will get an undefined um, solution. So here we solve for x like if it was a regular inequality. So you can add 1 to both sides or just move the 1, the negative 1 across. So that will be x cannot equal positive 1. So how can we say this in with words? So we will say all real numbers except x equals 1. How can we say that in interval notation? So before we do that, let's draw a number line. And let's say 0 is here, 1 is here. And we want to exclude 1. So I'm going to use an open circle. And right here, we know we have negative infinity. And here we have positive infinity. So we're going to take everything, like it says here, all real numbers. So from negative infinity all the way to 1. And we're going to use parentheses there to exclude 1. That's what it tells us. What's the left side? Same thing. Right side. So parentheses and then all the way to infinity. So how many intervals are we going to have? Three. 2. 1 and 2. So that will be from negative infinity to 1, union 1 to infinity. That will be an interval notation. Now let's see set notation. So for set notation, we will have um, Phrases x such that x belongs to the set of real numbers and x does not equal positive 1. Do we have a question? Any other symbols? And trust me, the sooner you learn them, the easier your life will be. Okay, so next. Let's look at uh, part C. So now we're going to follow the same process. We're going to take the denominator. And we're going to create that inequality that says that denominator cannot equal 0. Then we have a quadratic. So we're going to factor it. x, x. The sign is negative. That implies that the signs inside my binomials will be one of each, a positive and a negative. Factors of 15, we have 1 and 15, 3 and 5. Since this sign is negative, that means the number with the biggest absolute value keeps the negative. That would be 5 and 15, and then the 1 and 3 are positive, which combination gives me negative 2. That one. So we're going to have our factors x plus 3 and x minus 5. Now, by the zero factor property, we're going to take uh, each factor individually and create another inequality that will say that cannot equal zero. So x cannot equal 
negative 3, and x cannot equal positive 5. So now we have two exclusions. So with words, we will say something like all real numbers except x equals negative 3 or x equals negative, I'm sorry, positive 5. That's with words. Now let's write it with, with an interval. And let's go ahead and draw the number line first. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we have two things to exclude now. We have to exclude negative 3 and positive 5. So open circle. And now to determine our intervals, we're going to go from negative infinity to negative 3, parentheses there. And then from negative 3 to 5, and everything in between, every single decimal in there. And then from 5 to infinity, positive infinity. So how many intervals are we, have, are we going to have? Three. three. So negative infinity to negative 3. Union, negative 3 to 5. Union, 5 to infinity. That will be interval. And then this last, last one, let's do set. That will be any x such that x belongs to the set of real numbers and x does not equal to negative 3 or 5. And we can simply denote that with a comma in between the two numbers, the two restrictions or exclusions from our domain. Um, I want to make a quick commercial. The class of 2017 will be selling Propel Water until May 15. It's only a dollar and you can buy it all day long. So let's move on. Any questions, guys? No? How awesome is the water? Oh, the water is good. It has, um, it's actually workout water. Damn. So it does have a little bit of electrolytes. That's what I've been told by the commercials. Zero calories. Okay, uh, we're going to continue simplifying, and although here we don't have find the domain, I'm going to add that we're going to be finding domain, because on, when am I supposed to have you guys again? On Thursday, right? But you guys will be testing, and I understand that, and I feel very bad for you, but I know you're going to do great on that exam. Okay, uh, yes, the freshman. So I still need to, te to, to teach, I'm talking, I still need to teach to the sophomores. And so guess what? We have to go to the world and do it. So. Yes, you guys are going to have to watch it. Now, I, I will try to keep the video short. What we're going to be doing is graphing the rational functions that we have here. All right? But in return, I have some good news for you. I'm not going to give you a midterm exam. Why? Because we're almost done. I have to give you a final exam, and then you're testing all these things. It's okay if I'm recording. Um, they will be a work. And so I think it will be okay if instead of a midterm exam, we do a little project, like with a calculator, where you use it to graph, manipulate some things I'm going to talk about in a minute, and then you will turn in a paper instead of a midterm exam. How do you guys feel about that? Love it. I don't know. I think that will eliminate a little bit of stress, especially because you're going to have your college finals next week. Okay. And if I was to give you a midterm exam, it will have to be next week. All right, so moving on, back to the class. So let's go ahead and simplify the expression here. So we're going to have 2x squared, and the denominator, what will be the greatest common factor between 10x cubed and 2x squared? 2x squared. 
2x squared. And that is the GCF, right? Greatest common factor. So if we factor 2x squared from 10x cubed, we get 5x. Thank you. Was that our step? Yes. Okay. And then if we have negative 2x squared and we factor out positive 2x squared, we will get negative 1, right? Okay. Now, you could see clearly that the 2x squared and the 2x squared right here make up a 1, or we could say they cancel. So the simplified version will be 1 over 5x minus 1. So now, if my question is, find the domain. We're going to find, we're going to take that denominator right here, and we're going to create an inequality like we did before. So 5x minus 1 cannot equal 0. And then we're going to solve for x. So 5x cannot equal positive 1. And then x cannot equal 1 over 5 or 1 fifth. So that's one of the restrictions. But let me tell you one thing. There's one more restriction. And so I want you guys to think about it. And for that, I want you to look at the original version of the rational expression. And if that was a function, what other x value will make the denominator equal to it? So you could talk uh, within your group. I'm going to give you a minute. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Matthew. The number that we were looking for is zero. Now, let's see where that zero is going to come from, okay? There you go. So, if you look at this one, it's going to come from there. But let's say, let's see first if, if they're correct. I don't know. So, if we take the denominator and we substitute a zero in there, we will get 10 times zero to the third power minus 2 times zero to the second power. And what is zero to the third power? Zero. What is zero squared? Zero. What is ten times zero? So zero. What is two times zero? Zero. What is zero minus zero? Zero. So that is why we have to exclude zero as well, not only one fifth. And so where does that come from? Where do we lose it? We lost it here when we simplified and we cancel. All right? So Let's go ahead and create an inequality and then I'll solve it. You can see, so 2x squared cannot equal 0. So x squared cannot equal 0 over 2, and we know that 0 over 2 is 0. And how do we undo a square? Square root. We take the square root. And what is the square root of 0? 0. Okay? So for the domain, there are two restrictions. However, when we graph them, and this is what we're going to do on Thursday, that you uh, freshmen are going to miss that. Um, you're going to watch it on video, right? Yes? Yes? Okay. Because um, when we graph them, the one right here is going to be a vertical asymptote. Do you guys remember those? What type of function has vertical asymptotes? It cannot touch like the y-axis. Logarithmic, yes. Which function has the horizontal asymptote? Radical, rational. Rational, yes, like we're doing. Which other one? No, no, there's no rational function. Exponential. Exponential. Those have the horizontal asymptote. So guess what? Rational functions have both. Vertical and horizontal. So the one right here uh, for one fifth, that is going to be a vertical asymptote. However, this one here is going to be a an open circle. Some books refer to it as um, hole on the graph, but it will be an open circle. Okay. Now, but both together, together they're called discontinuity. Together, they're discontinuous. So on Thursday, when I graph them, they're going to look different at, for this particular function, it will look different at one fifth and also at x equals zero. 
All right. Now we're going to move on to the next one, which is an excellent question. If you need to review a little bit about factoring, um, we could of course use the trial and error method. But if we do that, I could spend some time here deciding: Do I need 9x or x? Do I need 4 and 1? Or do I need 3x and 3x? Or do I need 2 and 2? And so I don't want to waste time doing that. So I'm going to factor it by grouping. And so if I factor it by grouping, we have 9x squared plus 13x plus 4. So what I'm going to try to do is make four terms. We need four terms. So that we can make two groups of two at a time. So the first step is to multiply the leading coefficient, which is 9, times the constant term, which is positive 4. And that gives us positive 36. Second step is to factor that positive 36, and that will be 1 and 36, 2 and 18. 3 and 12, 4 and 14, and 6 and 6. And because this sign is positive, I know both signs will be the same. And because this one is positive, I know both will be positive. So everything is positive. Now, which combination is going to give us positive 13? Am I doing something wrong? Yeah. The 14 should be at 9, right? Okay, sorry. So that was a 12, and there should be a 9. Okay, so that was a 1, right? Okay, so we are going to, what we're going to do is break down that 13x by using those new numbers. Plus 4 and plus 9. So, so far we got 9x squared plus... 4x plus 9x, and let's not forget about the constant term. Then we can make two groups here. We can make 9x squared with a 4x, or we could even switch the 9x here, and then group the 4x with the 4. Now that we have two groups, we can factor each group individually by factoring out the GCF. So in this case, it's 9x. We factor that, we get x plus 1. The next binomial, the GCF, is just a number, a 4. And if we factor out a 4, we will get x plus 1. Uh, then finally, from here, we have 9x. We have a plus 4. Uh, so, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention right here, this is our GCF, right? The x plus 1. So that's going to be our first factor, x plus 1, because it repeats in both. Miss, are you recording? I think so. 9x plus 4. Yes, I am that. 9x plus 4. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the other uh, page. 9x plus 1, 9x plus 4. So that's what goes here. X plus 1 and 9x plus 4. So what I want you guys to do within your group is to factor the denominator that you have here as a polynomial. Okay. Feel free to talk, please. So let's check our answer. What are the factors here? 8x minus 7 and the other one? X plus 1. Well, let's see. I see a little problem. So I'm going to work it out. Okay, so if I was to work that problem out with this one, um, could you read the phone number, okay? 8x squared. Minus 7. 
Okay, so I'm going to follow the steps, and I see that maybe there was a little issue with your sign. So step one is to multiply um, the positive a, the leading coefficient, times the constant term, which is negative 7, and that will give me a negative 56. Then step two is to factor. And for factoring, we could use uh, 156, 2, and 28. Um, 3, it doesn't work. 4 and 14, see there was the 14. Uh, 5, 6, 7, seven and 8. Um, in this case, we have a negative quantity, so our factors will have one of each, the sign. How do we decide who keeps the positive and negative? We look at the sign here, and that tells us the number with the biggest absolute value, which I usually, actually always, write down on the right side. Yes, you guys remember that? So that will keep the positive signs, those numbers, and this will be negative. So now look at them and tell me which combination gives you a positive one when you come to add them. All right. So this term here is going to be broken into negative 7x plus 8x minus 7. Now, there are two ways we could solve this. One of them is like this. We will group 8x squared minus 7x plus 8x minus 7. You might be thinking, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to factor much there, but actually we will. Here we can factor out an x, and that will give us 8x minus 7. The other one, we can factor out a 1, and that will give me 8x minus 7. So now, what is the GCF, guys? 8x minus 7. So 8x minus 7. And where is my other factor going to come from? x plus 1. That's one way. The other way to factor it is by rearranging the terms. So I could say 8x squared, write this one first, plus 8x. And then minus 7x, minus 7. But once you have like negative like that, and you're doing grouping, you need to be careful with those signs. Um, so right here, we will have 8x squared plus 8x. And then I usually just use a positive sign and then include the negative inside the parentheses. So right here, GCF is 8x. We get x plus 1. And here we will factor out not a 7, but a negative 7. And that will give me x plus 1. If you're not sure, you could always divide negative 7x, factor out a negative 7, so you get a positive x. And then you have negative 7, factor out a negative 7, so you get a positive 1. Now this is the GCF. And the other factor will come from 8x minus 7. But if you notice, we actually have the same factors. Right? They're just in different order, but they're the same. All right. Going back to this problem, those were the factors. So x plus 1, x plus 1 is out. Simplified version is that, then 8x minus 7. Now, when we're looking at graphing this type of graph, the restriction that will come from here is going to give us a, an open circle. And the restriction that will come from here is going to give us, actually I'm wrong, it's the other way. Open circle. And this one will be a vertical. Together they're both discontinuity. That means like the, there's a gap in the graph. Amy, put yourself on your backpack, please. Sorry, did you guys get a chance to copy everything? Okay. I know I promised you a break, but let's finish this one first. I yes. Well yes. A little bit. But this one is so easy, I just want to get it over with. Okay, quickly addition. I'm talking. Addition of polynomials. is commutative, uh, meaning you can change the order and the result will be the same.
So in this case, 2 plus x is the same as x plus 2. And so x plus 2 divided by x plus 2, um, if we take it all together, cancels out, then it's equal to 1, not 0, 1. Now let's look at the next term. We have, I'm going to rearrange them, and we will get negative x plus 2. Not the same as what we have on the bottom. In fact, they are completely opposite. So how can we make them have the same sign? We did some of this last week. Negative 1 multiply or divide by negative 1 or even factor out a negative 1. So if we do that, um, we have negative x divided by negative 1. Oh, sorry. So that will be positive x. And then we have a positive 2 divided by negative 1, we get a negative 2. Now the bottom, it has x minus 2. So right here, the answer will be negative 1. Okay, number four, this one is also fast. Uh, I'm going to rearrange the terms. Negative 2x squared minus, not minus, but plus 18. The bottom, of it, I'm going to leave it the same. Okay, now between 2x squared and 18, what will be the GCF? 2. Two. But for convenience, I'm going to factor negative 2. So if I factor negative 2 from here, I will get x squared. And if I factor out negative 2 from positive 18, it must be negative 9. Why did I do that? Why do I want to have x squared minus 9? Cancel out the x squared on the bottom. Well, we cannot cancel it straight like that because we have negative and positive signs in between. But we could actually factor that even further because it's a difference of what? A square. So we have a plus 3 and a minus 3. So that's why I chose to factor out a negative sign. Uh, now on the bottom, let's factor it, two binomials, so we have x and x, this is negative, so that means we have, our signs will be one of each, positive and negative, and the factors of three are only three and one, and because this Ooh. sign is negative, three will carry the negative sign, three and one. So I'm going to write them here again, Ooh, that's uh -huh. and that becomes pretty obvious, right, that's out of the picture. And so now the final answer would just be negative 2 times x plus 3 over x plus 1. And I know you might be tempted here to cancel the x's. You, can. you cannot. Because we have x plus 1 and we have x plus 3. And those two are very different from each other. And you cannot just cross out the x because of the positive signs in between. So that could be an answer. Um, factor form, or we can go ahead and distribute the negative 2, so we will get negative 2x minus 6 divided by x plus 1. Both of them are correct. Okay, so we're going to go take a three-minute break. Oh, the next problem we're going to simplify. <laughs> it's going to involve a sum of of what? Cubes. So right there what we have is a sum of cubes where we have x cubed plus 2 cubed. Um, right here on the denominator I'm just going to change the order of those two. And so how do we find, uh, how do we factor sums of cubes? We did cover this last semester, maybe very long ago. And what you do is you take the cube root of this term so first of all, you're going to factor into a product of a binomial and a trinomial. So the cube root of a cube is a, the cube root of b cube is just b. And what goes here, you take this term and you square it, so that will be a squared. You take this term and you square it, so that will be plus b squared. And the term in the middle, weird thing, you start with a sum of cubes, but the term in the middle of the trinomial will have a negative sign. And then it will be the product of the first term times the second. So a, B. There's no need to double it, it that's all it will be. So now following that pattern, we're going to factor 
the binomial on the numerator, which is a sum of cubes. So cube root of x cube is x, cube root of 2 cube is just 2, or you could think the cube root of 8. Um, and so now following the pattern, we take this term and we square it. We take that term and we square it, where it's 2 squared. Or, and then the term in the middle, remember the weird negative sign there, and it's the product of x times 2, so that's 2x. Here we had x plus 2, so we could eliminate those because they make up a 1, and the reduced form of that rational function happens to be that. And if we were to graph it, that one will actually look like a parabola. And the interesting part here is that it wouldn't have any asymptotes. Instead, it will have only one discontinuity that will look like an open circle at x equals negative 2. So let's say negative 2 here. It will be like an open circle on the parabola. So let's move on to part B. Part B, we're going to simplify again. We can factor out a 2. We get y squared plus 1. Can we factor a sum of squares? No, we cannot. Only sum of cubes and difference of cubes. For squares, we can only factor difference of squares. So I'm going to group the y cube minus 5y squared and then the y minus 5. And that is okay. I know y and 5 and negative 5 don't have anything in common, but that's fine. So the numerator is the same. You cannot factor it any further. But the bottom, yes, we're going to factor by grouping. So the G GCF of that group is um, y squared. So we factor y squared, and we will get y minus 5. And from this group, they have no GCF. So the greatest common factor is just 1. If you factor 1, you will get y minus 5. Not minus 1, but minus 5. So we have 2, y squared plus 1. And on the bottom we have our GCF, which happens to be y minus 5. That will be our first factor. And our second factor is going to come from here, y squared plus 1. Now we could um, eliminate those two. They make up a 1. The final answer is just 2 divided by y minus 5. Now, what will happen? Well, let's just skip that part. Now, um, is there a question on the factoring or anything that I cancel? I feel like I'm going too fast. All right. Now, the next one, I want you guys to go to your first slide. And we're going to look at the statement that is in this box right here. So it says here that when you have a negative sign right in the middle, you could assign that negative to either the numerator or the denominator, but not both. Because if you say negative A divided by negative B, negative divided by negative is positive. So you will get something like that, and that is definitely not the same. Right? So the negative only goes to one or the other. So using that idea, we're going to answer example 6. And so it says, list some equivalent form of that expression. You see the negative is on top. So I can put the negative with the numerator, like that. Or I can put the negative with the denominator. But notice how I'm using parentheses there. So those two are equivalent form. Or I can go ahead and distribute the negative sign. And that would give me negative 5x plus 1 over x plus 9. Here, I will get 5x minus 1 over negative x minus 9. All four of those are equivalent forms of this one here. Okay, and now the very last problem that we have here. Well, before that, is there a question about what I did with the negative sign? So here I went ahead and distributed. That's how I got negative 5 x plus 1. And here I distributed the negative sign. Any questions? 
Right. So the very last problem we have. Um, who would like to read it? Okay. Thank you, Linda. Go ahead. For the ICO production company, the rational function C of x is equal to 2.6x plus 10,000 divided by x. Describe the company's cost per disk of pressing x amount of compact disks. Find the cost per disk. Bless you. Okay. I'm going to define a variable, first of all, and that will be x. X obviously is the independent variable in this case, and it is representing the number of CDs. Do you guys have any CDs? Do you own? Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. All right. So, why do we have this dividing here? Well, because we're talking about the cost per disk. How much is costing the company to produce each and every one of them? So it makes sense that we divide by that. For example, if you go shopping and you get like, um, I spent a hundred dollars and I bought five shirts, what was the cost of every shirt? Twenty dollars. So that's something like what we're doing here with this function. Okay? We're going to divide by the number of. Now, let me explain to you what's going on on top. So we have this number, 2.6. And this is going to be like the cost per unit, and we can call it like the, it could be like the material, materials. Now, what about this 10,000 here? That's going to be a fixed cost, no matter how many CDs you'll, you make. Either it's a zero, a one, a 10, a hundred, a thousand you still pay $10,000. So um, what kind of things could be paid with the $10,000? What? Come on. You got to think a little bit. Materials, we're considering that one here, but maybe other types of materials. Can you guys think of some? The machinery, that's very good. Salary for workers, yes. What else? For the rent, transportation, so we could say like the shipping, handling, which we could summarize it as the logistics. Uh, Health insurance for the workers, okay. Yeah, so whether you make zero this, you will still pay to that. That's why some businesses go bankrupt. So let's see how much would it cost to make 100. So we find C of X. And that will be 2.6 times 100. That will tell us kind of like for each disk how much is spent, like in material. Then plus the 10,000. And we divide by 100 because, remember, we're dividing by x. And that will be 260 plus 10,000 divided by 100. This will be 10,260 divided by 100. So that would be 102.6. So if you own that business, would you think it was worth it to only make 100 discs? How are you going to sell them? Like, who will pay that, right? Unless it's like a very pricey software, like Mathematica. I will pay that. Okay. But... Let's see, what about a thousand? So I want you guys to see if that will be worth the trouble to create a thousand. And you can work this problem with your group, with your table. Okay, let's check out our answer. So if you were to produce a thousand discs, how, how much will that be, the price per unit? $12.60. And so let's just assume for a minute that we're talking about music. If that was the cost, how much would you guys think they should sell it for? Like, how much do you sell it for? $15. $15. They go like between $15, maybe $20, right? Something like that. 
So, will that be like worth it? Yeah. Are you making a reasonable profit? Actually, no, you're not. No. You make it like way less than 50%. But let's compare it to if you produce 10,000 this, the cost is only 360. And if you're going to sell them between 15 to 20 bucks, then yeah, that's a killer profit, right? And so that's why like big uh, record labels, they're still there, while the little ones, they end up closing. So this is the end of the lecture and the video.